Hi everybody, it's Alex Berry for Wargamer.com. Today I'm here to review Bloody April, battle uh, for the air war over Ara during World War I. Uh, gameplay takes place between sort of March and May 1917, and you've got sort of all the really interesting cast of characters. This is where Rick Toven was. And as you can see sort of on the front cover, we got Rick Toven here. Um, and it's, you know, the part of France where some of the major battles occurred. You've got, you know, Vimy Ridge, uh, Cambrai, where the, the major tanks were, were used. Um, so it's that sort of the area that this was in. And it's, it's an interesting, very detailed, very, very detailed um, air war battle. Uh, you've got um, very good sort of playbook has several scenarios I think you're gonna get if you pick up this game and you get into it you're gonna get a lot of replay value out of it because there's just so many scenarios um, that come with the game you've got 30 scenarios in the scenario book the scenario book also comes with a very detailed sort of playthrough uh, rule book and scenario book or in you know mostly black and white with some some color but you've got examples of play, which really kind of highlight and explain how movement works, how the battles work. Um, I think GMT, which is the publisher of this game, does a good job, uh, usually with examples of play. They've done it here. You've got a separate rule book. Um, it's about 30 pages of rules. You've got a very good index. That's, you know, GMT is really hit and miss on have they put an index into the game. They've done it here. It's excellent. Um, you know, rules are good, um, you know, clearly delineates the standard rules from the advanced. Um, it's long, though. it's 30 pages, you know, it's pretty, pretty complex for uh, a rule book, and it's more complex than, than most GMT games that I've played. Um, and then you've got uh, a host of player aids. Now, I really think this game was sort of designed for solitaire or for online email play um, because you just have so many player aids that you can, you know, spread out over your table, um, you know, which seems to me to indicate that's a solitaire play or for, you know, you've set up the board and you're playing it via email and then, you know, actually physically moving it on the pieces, whereas on face-to-face, -face, it it's like, okay, where did I put, I need the weather chart, which one's the weather chart? Um, and you're looking for, for that to do, you know, the weather modifier. And if it was all together in sort of like a little book or, you know, they were connected more, sort of this is the biggest player aid and it, it kind of unfolds. If they had them all in one unfolding chart, you know, I think that would be better for face-to-face -face play because it would allow you to, you know, have both players having this. You wouldn't be shuffling around papers looking for the right chart because it would, it would be all in one thing. Um, now, you know, if you've got the table space, you can lay them all out and it's a little easier to do. But in face-to-face -face play, that's, you know, you usually don't have a big enough table for that. I mean, there are so many charts here. Um, so I, I just think that the game has really been designed for online or solitaire play. You can definitely play this game solitaire. It's a chit activation, so you just sort of, you know, okay, we draw out of the cup, and oh, it's, you know, the British, they move these many planes, then the Germans, they're moving this many planes, which, you know, is makes it an easy solitaire system. You know, it's not a card-driven game, uh, you know, with that type of aspect to it, which would make it difficult to play solitaire. I think you can play this game solitaire if you're a solitaire gamer. However, I think there's a lot of time that can be spent into investing in this system. You have the campaigns, and they're really divided up into how many planes there are, how many turns the the game is now on the smaller scenarios you know where there's only you know a couple of planes on each side you know maybe 10 planes for the british five for the germans 
in one scenario, it's going to be, it, there's just not that many interesting decisions. And it's going to be an exercise in rolling the dice and checking the chart. You know, there's charts for everything. Is you know, there's a ground uh, observation chart. Have your ground observers detected uh, enemy planes? Seen what type they are? Is it a dummy plane, not a real uh, squadron flight? Um, who are on the planes potentially? You've got you know, are we engaging in battle when once the planes meet? Um, you know, planes are going to have to have some movement when they enter the same space as another squadron. Have they detected those other planes already? Um, that will add to does an engagement incur? Um, more likely to if they've been detected than if they haven't been detected. But you roll the dice for does an engagement actually occur? Then do you roll some dice on are you know are you able to get off a shot and a hit? And just everything is all about rolling the dice and checking the charts. And for a small scenario, I don't think it's that interesting gameplay. Um, because you're limited in, you know, I just have this two flights that I'm moving. Um, not, I can't really set up a lot of stuff with, you know, you know, massive amounts of flights, um, which you can do in the bigger campaigns. Uh, the advantage in the small scenarios is, you know, you can play it in an evening. These large campaigns, they're going to take hours upon hours upon hours to play, um, which is perfect, I think, for email. You know, you can play a a great campaign over you know a couple of months via email or you set it up solitaire and just play when you want but for face-to-face -face play if you're going to be playing um, the small scenarios which you can handle in an evening or a day it's not going to be that interesting um, the decisions because you just don't have enough planes whereas the larger campaigns is do I have the time to play this large campaign where the decisions get much more interesting. Um, I, I really think you're going to have to judge for yourself on whether or not this is a game for you. If you're an email uh, board gamer or if you're a solitaire gamer, I think this could be you know, right up your alley, especially if you're interested in air combat, if you're interested in especially World War I combat, this sort of time period. Uh, the game is, is streamlined, even though, as I mentioned, the rule book is, you know, 30 pages or so. It's intuitive. It's not, it's, you're not constantly checking up each roll once you've actually got the system down. You know, I think it's going to take a game or two to get the system down, but once you have that down, um, you know, you're not going to be constantly checking the rule book. You're going to be constantly checking the charts for your dice rolls, but you're not going to check the rule book. And... But I think if you're only thinking, oh, I can only devote, you know, three, four hours a game to it, I think look elsewhere for gaming because these smaller scenarios, they're just not interesting enough. But why don't we take a look at the board? So sort of here's the board on setup. Um, what we're playing here is the third scenario. It's a sort of a slightly smaller one. Here it is sort of in the rule books. Um, you know, some info about the scenario, sort of what historically happened, the time of day it is, how to roll on the weather chart, um, you know, we're rolling in March, the ground setup, the taskings of the planes, um, the uh, order of battle of the units. Um, here, uh, for the Germans, they could have had another uh, squadron join in. Uh, we rolled for that and they weren't available. Uh, Yasta 30. Um, so we just have sort of the one main thing. So this is sort of a German log sheet we have set up. Um, we have a dummy unit uh, on a counter A and the actual unit, counter B. We have sort of the, the planes that's being used. This is the, the HAB 2s. Here is their, their card where we've got sort of more detailed information. We also then have who are piloting the planes, uh, the ammo current, um, you know, that will decrease as we're firing. And if we zoom in here on the board, we've got uh, both counter A and B here. Um, 
they've got this question mark on them because they're unidentified. Once they're seen, uh, the enemy, you know, can be aware of what plane they are, have better chance for actually engaging them. And so there's two counters. So during play, you know, they might, you know, split off. Only one of them is an actual one. So that's sort of how the fog of war element works in this game. Is there's going to be, you know, hidden movement in that, I don't know, is that an actual flight that the opposing player is moving? Or is that simply a dummy flight and once it's actually detected, I can see there's no planes there at all. So that's sort of an interesting aspect of the game. Makes it, you know, a little more interesting. We can see here there's some uh, artillery, uh, you know, across the trench line. We've got the, the brown is the British, the blue is the German. And then we can also zoom in on an actual flight. Um, just let the camera focus here. Um, as we can see, one of the issues is you're going to also have to put the altitude down. So we hear these flights are at plus O medium. Altitude is going to be very important during the game for can you actually engage the enemy. If they're a full, you know, two bands ahead of you, so sort of there's, you know, there's deck, there's low, there's medium, there's high, and there's very high. Now, you know, something at deck level can't engage, um, you know, planes at medium. You know, vice versa, they, it could happen. You know, medium can dive down and attack deck. Or if you're just simply one different, you know, low can attack uh, high. So here's the different player aids I wanted to go through. You've got this for setup and just sort of reference. You've got the list of aerodromes. Um, you know, just easy to check where on the map it is because it's based on squares. Um, here's sort of how the system works. If we zoom in, we can see um, basically left to right is the first two numbers and then um, up and down are the last two. So here we've got two, three, two, five, and then further down, uh, further south is two, three, two, six. Whereas if you want to head um, east, you go from two, three to two, four, and then to two, five. That's sort of just how the system works. It's a good grid system. It's pretty easy to find what you're looking for. Um, you then have sort of the artillery cooperation matrix used in some more advanced scenarios for artillery as well as photography plates. Um, are you taking good pictures or not? Um, useful in certain scenarios. You've got the detection table. Um, are your ground observers actually detecting things? You've got uh, sort of the sun arc. This is for the advanced rules on are you detecting things or is the sun sort of blocking your view. You've got a sequence of play. This really should have been at least two um, so that both players could have it. Uh, sort of breaks down what how you set up prior to scenario determining weather. We've already done this in our game here. We've rolled. It was clear. No wind. Um, wind will affect drift and how the planes occur. Uh, ground planning phase. If there were sort of secret, you can set up hidden artillery here. In this scenario, there's no hidden artillery. We can see it all sort of just on the board. Um, and then, you know, during this scenario, you check for random events. If it's after uh, the second turn, um, there's weather, which changes every 10 turns. You do the ground detection phase, then movement, um, tracking, and admin phase. After the scenario, when it's finished, um, that's when the last German or British flights return to the aerodrome or is destroyed, or when the players simply uh, agree. You can see, okay, do they recover? Um, and then you, you check the victory conditions. 
you have a planning map, um, which is useful for if you know you don't want to be looking at the board directly while you're planning your your hidden um, AA. You know, someone could notice, oh, this is the part of the board they're examining. So that's useful um, for when you're putting on hidden air. What it would show up is, um, you know, you'd mark it down. You've got uh, sort of the basic weather chart um, and then how the weather changes. What's interesting is, you know, some of this stuff isn't actually even on the, uh, the sheet. So for instance, determining what planes the Germans use is actually here uh, on the rule book. So there's just, you know, there's so many charts you need to check um, and it's not all put together. This is sort of the main one, um, how things are done. I think they should have had those other charts with this main chart. Uh, the main things to see or sort of the engagement table when you're seeing is the plane going or is there going to be a battle occurring and you roll two dice on the engagement tail table and you, then you affect the modifiers, you know, altitude advantage here comes in quite a bit. Um, you then, once you have a fight, you then move and check the damage table, shot resolution, you know, was there actually a, a hit? Um, and so on. So initially in, in this scenario, you're going to have uh, only the British player move until they actually cross the trench lines and then the Germans will take off. The Germans currently don't have any altitude so they're going to have to gain altitude quickly in this game. Um, you know, so initially you don't need to do any chit draws. Once the lines crossed you would do a chit draw. The Germans then decide do they want to go first or do they want the, the British to have the first for the chit draw? You would draw the chit. Um, here in this scenario, we'd be doing the, the two for the small. The opposite side is two for large, depending on how many planes are in the game. Um, so that's sort of just how the chit draw works. Um, the battle can get more complex if you're doing the dogfight rules. Um, on the simple, it's really just you check first on the engagement chart, was there an engagement? Then you check, you know, yes, you've engaged the enemy. You then do sort of shot resolution. And then did you fire anything? And then you check sort of just the damage table. Um, so it's you know, you've got the AA firing when you move over the AA. And I mean, it's very, you know, right now this is unactivated. By moving a plane over, it would become activated. Um, as we can see, this plane, these, these planes are sort of at the low deck. You can spend things to gain altitude, um, but you're moving slower. As we can see, the higher you are, you actually move slower. If we see on the, the HAB plane, you're reducing in speed the higher you are, but then you're able to dive and, you know, spend altitude for speed. Um, this is sort of your time to climb ratio on, you know, how far do you move from deck, then from low, and then up to medium. And then ammo is very important in this game. You know, I've played so many uh, times where it's just you're firing off and you're missing because, you know, Getting this shot resolution, if you don't have, you know, great modifiers, um, you know, you're, you're just missing, uh, not causing any, any damage. Um, so it's, it's tough sometimes to actually get a shot off. Some of these planes will only have two ammo, and then you need to return to your aerodrome to refuel. Um, in this small scenario, this, you know, Sometimes the planes will engage and nothing really interesting occurs because um, all the shots missed and they, they go back to the aerodrome. I really think this game excels 
at sort of the bigger, larger campaigns. Uh, as we can see, if we check, you know, here is, you know, the campaign 21, and we're seeing just how many German units there are, how many British, and it, it becomes a lot more a lot more interesting the more planes you have um, but then the time spent in the game is much much more onerous this is you know the small scenario um, you know there's not too many planes for each side as we can see so much of the map here not being used um, really this is where the AA concentration is here um, we've got British planes set up here, one of them, which is a dummy, and then we've got the German German plane here. Um, I, I think the map's good. I think the rules are streamlined once you get into it. There's a lot, a lot of chart checking. It feels like it's an old school war game um, that's been streamlined and sort of updated, but it's still a lot of chart checking without really that interesting decisions unless you're playing you know more advanced rules gets more interesting with the dog fights but I just don't think given the time at least for me personally um, I'd rather spend my time playing some other games I think if you're really interested in this time period um, or if you're a solitaire gamer or if you play online a lot this might be a great game for you face-to-face -face gaming I don't think it's worth it because the small scenarios which you can do in a reasonable amount of time just don't have that uh, you know really interesting decision making process there's just not enough to do it's almost all roll the dice check the chart um, you know whereas it becomes more interesting the more planes you have up in the air for the more interesting things that you can do um, but that's sort of just basic overview of how the game plays. Um, you know, to really go in the rules, it would take a while. There's, uh, I think, some good stuff up on the internet. Um, more detailed sort of playthroughs. The book, the rule book itself, and the playbook has a very good detailed uh, sample play sort of. And I think it's easy to grasp this game. It's just. It's just, do you want to invest the time in it? And I think if this is one of your few games that you own, yes, it's going to be payoff if you're interested in this time period. If you're interested in air combat, especially World War I air combat, it's going to pay off. Um, but otherwise, for me, I think it's too much of a in time investment in gaming, given the enjoyment that I get out of it. Anyway, till next time.